7-3. Now, the Middle East is on the cusp of a very, very serious war. Israeli troops have been told in the last few hours to get ready because a ground invasion of Gaza to eradicate Hamas is imminent. So you are looking at an imminent ground invasion, and Israeli troops have been told they've got to get ready. So let's just recap for a second, just to remember how we got here. So Hamas terrorists butchered 1,400 Israelis. It is the worst single loss of Jewish life in a single day since the Holocaust. Got to remember that. Hamas still have over 200 people as hostages, including babies, women, elderly women. And Israel's bombing retaliation of Gaza has seen, according to Hamas, 3,500 people lose their lives. So you are seeing now limited supplies slowly going uh, into Gaza via Egypt, and that's a something that was brokered by the United States. So I'm talking food, medicine, and water, because there is a humanitarian disaster unfolding in Gaza at the moment. And then you've got Hezbollah, which, for those who don't know, are far more dangerous than Hamas. They're in southern Lebanon, right on Israel's northern border, and Hezbollah is threatening to significantly up their attacks on northern Israel, while the people who fund... Hezbollah and Hamas, Iran, they're just sitting back with their two proxies causing untold horror, and Tehran itself has threatened, well, we'll be getting involved against Israel if necessary. The whole thing is terrifying. Now, the US President Joe Biden, he's returned to Washington, D.C., and so concerned is President Biden that he has addressed the American people. Now, you've got to remember, he hasn't done this very often, Joe Biden. President Biden said that he stands by Israel, but says that America made mistakes after 9-11 because the country was so enraged at the slaughter of its countrymen and women, so enraged. Effectively, President Biden's warning to Israel was, don't overreact. When I was in Israel yesterday, I uh, said that when America experienced the hell of 9-11, we felt enraged as well. While we sought and got justice, we made mistakes. So I caution the government of Israel not to be blinded by rage. He also said that an independent Israel and Palestine, a two-state solution, must always be the objective, while Islamophobia and anti-Semitism is not the answer. As I said in Israel, as hard as it is, we cannot give up on peace. We cannot give up on a two-state solution. Israel and Palestinians equally deserve to live in safety dignity and peace. And through all of this, President Biden reminded the West that we must stand with both Israel and Ukraine, and that includes military aid, 14 billion of it now pledged to Israel from the United States of America. That's why tomorrow I'm going to send to Congress an urgent budget request to fund America's national security needs, to support our critical partners, including Israel and Ukraine. It's a smart investment that's going to pay dividends for American security for generations. Help us keep American troops out of harm's way. Help us build a world that is safer, more peaceful, more prosperous for our children and grandchildren. This is a very dangerous time. Very dangerous times for all of us. So what happens next and where does Australia fit in all this? Elliot Abrams is, he served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor in the administration of President George W. Bush. He supervised US policy in the Middle East for the White House and as a special representative for Iran and Venezuela in the administration of Donald Trump. He knows a thing or two, I reckon. He's in Australia at the moment and he's been speaking to our national security experts in Canberra. And I'm pleased to say Elliot Abrams is giving us some of his time too. He's on the line. Mr. Abrams, good day. Good day. Good to be here. So we're expecting a a ground invasion for quite a while now, Israel going into Gaza. Is there any way that it won't happen? No. No. Their goal is to crush Hamas, to eliminate Hamas as a military threat. And there's no way to do that without going in on the ground. Why has it taken so long? Because we were expecting it to happen 48, 72 hours uh, after Hamas's uh, attack on Israel to begin with. I, I give you two answers. First, uh, there's a there is an air campaign, and they want to hit the targets they know about and that can be reached from the air. The other is, you know, they've got a reserve army. Their standing army is quite small. They called up 360,000 reservists, but you know, when they show up, they've they've got to get armed. They've got to see the plans. They've got to see the intelligence. They've got to get organized, and that's what they've been doing in the last week. 
What does it look like, the Israeli Defence Force marching into Gaza? What does that look like as a conflict? It's going to be brutal. Uh, this kind of urban warfare is. If you think of Iraq, in which uh, Australia participated in, in cities like Fallujah, uh, urban warfare is the worst. And the Israelis are going to have a significant number of casualties as they try to hit what they know are uh, arms depots, warehouses, uh, offices of Hamas. Uh, and, and Hamas makes a specialty of putting its weapons under schools and under hospitals and under mosques. So the Israelis have a very tough job ahead of them. And uh, they've been taking the time in this last week, as they should, to try to plan it out and to plan it in a way where there will be the smallest number of civilian casualties possible. How long are we are we talking here? Is this going to go on for years and years and years, like we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan? No, it's a you know it's a small space, but it could certainly go on for several months. This is not a you know a two or three week deal. That means a lot of people die. Well, uh, there's never been a war where innocent civilians were not hurt, and I think you started the right way by saying, so why is it happening? Because Hamas chose war. They don't give a damn about the people of Gaza. They don't care. And when the Israelis said people in northern Gaza Gaza should move south, get out of the range of what is likely coming, it was Hamas who said, no, don't go. They just don't care. Uh, What does it look like then? What What is the end game here for the Israelis? So you eradicate or crush Hamas, and then what? Do you have to occupy Gaza? Well, that's the thing they want to avoid very much. This, your question is a really key question. Who governs Gaza after the war? When the Israelis left in 2005, the Palestinian Authority governed for about a year and a half, and they were kicked out by Hamas. They are still governing in the West Bank. I think we need to get a kind of consortium of the Arab League, Egypt, the Gulf states who have the money, uh, the U.S., Jordan, to figure this out and to try to put in a kind of temporary authority there that can, for the first time since 2007, when Hamas took over, provide decent government to the people of Gaza. Can I just cast your mind back to when you were a national security advisor, or deputy national security advisor, to President George W. Bush? Do you agree with President Joe Biden uh, today when he said that the Americans made mistakes after 9-11, effectively warning the Israelis, just be careful, don't overreact? I heard that line from the president, and you know, what I would like to say if he were on the line here with us is, is, what are you referring to? Uh, As I recall it, two days, for example, two days after 9-11, President Bush visited a mosque in Washington, making the point that uh, hatred of of Muslims is unacceptable, prejudice, discrimination, unacceptable. Now, if he's talking about how the war was prosecuted, I'm sure we made mistakes. I'm sure we did plenty of mistakes in World War II and the Korean War and the Vietnam War. That's what happens in wars. Uh, But uh, I think the Israelis know this, and they know they've got a very tough fight now in world opinion. We just saw it with this hospital thing. They didn't do it. Hamas, Islamic Jihad did it. They got blamed for days. They know this kind of maltreatment, unfairness, is coming. They're going to be as careful as they can be. Hezbollah, Lebanon, how likely is their involvement? You know, I bet against it, but it's really close. If it's not 50-50, it's, you know, 55-45 against, because the Iranians have always wanted to do this. And we're talking about Iran. The decision will be made in Tehran, Iran, not in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, And if they see Israel, you know, deeply engaged in a war in Gaza, they may say, now's our chance to attack. And I think that's why the, President Biden sent those carriers to the Mediterranean as a kind of deterrent. But the chances of war on the northern front there, Israel against Hezbollah, uh, are really quite considerable. And uh, anybody who's got, you know, who knows the region knows that uh, Iran is at the heart of all of these problems. And it may decide, let's give Israel a second war. It's frightening stuff. 
Now, we're here in Australia, long, long way away from it. We've got protests all over the place. We've got a split federal Labor government, people seemingly needing to take sides in this conflict. Where do you see Australia's place in this conflict? Well, there's a couple of things. First, the Israelis care about the opinion of democratic countries, Canada, Australia, England. So if you think that, well, you know, nobody's going to listen to what Australia says, I think that's wrong. I would like to see clarity on the part of the government of Australia that um, this is a fight against terror. That is why you were in the Iraq war, Mm. because it was a fight against ISIS and Al Qaeda. This is a fight against another terrorist group, Hamas. I'd like to see great care taken in the standards of war that are applied to Israel. They have to abide by the laws of war, but you can't say that they don't have a right to defend themselves. And you've got to apply to them the standards that Australia applied to itself in the Iraq war. You've got to be fair about this. Yeah, no, fair enough. That, that makes more than enough sense. What about Donald Trump? Clearly, you've got a presidential election in the United States end of next year. So you're going to have 12 months of campaigning and electioneering. Yep. You've worked with Donald Trump. What does he do? Uh, <laughs> I think he's been irresponsible in the last few weeks. I mean, his attacks on on Netanyahu, I mean, these are just comments that come from self-regard. It's all about Donald Trump, frankly. I don't think he's been doing anything useful and positive uh, in the last, particularly the last week, while Israelis have uh, faced this terrible attack. So it's unfortunate. This is all happening in the middle of it or at the beginning of an American political campaign. It's bad timing because many politicians are going to be tempted to say it's all about me, 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 rather than being responsible. And then you add the conflict in Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine, and you add this into the mix. And where is the world at in the moment? You've been studying this and you've lived this for your entire life at the highest echelons of intelligence and national security within the United States. What's your best calculation here? I think what we're seeing is, frankly, a return to the Cold War with two sides. Uh, We saw that in Ukraine. We saw all of Europe and the U.S. supporting Ukraine against Russia. We've seen Russia and China in the last week being pro-Hamas, anti-Israel, being pro-Ukraine, excuse me, being pro-Iran. And meanwhile, Iran is shipping drones to the Russians for use in Ukraine. So you've got two sides. It's basically what we used to call the free world, the democratic countries of the world. On one side, Russia, China, Iran, and a few hangers on like Cuba, North Korea. On the other side, it's where we were from about 1945 to about 1990. It's back again. There's two sides here. And we know which side Australia is on. It's on the side of of freedom and democracy. Elliot Abrams, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Fascinating. My pleasure.